to the program. I'm Virginia Trioli. It's wonderful to be with you this evening. Just a few hours ago, we had an audience here planned of 100 people. We've paired that right back to just our questioners, given the imminent lockdown. Joining me on the panel tonight, GP and former AMA President Mukesh Hakawal, who's been on the front line of the COVID response from the beginning. Broadcaster and author Michelle Laurie, who co-hosts the Australian True Crime podcast. Radio broadcaster and a man of many opinions, Steve Price. Senior economist Alison Pennington. And from lockdown in Sydney, epidemiologist Mary Louise McClaws. Please make them all very welcome. Um, we went through a long extended lockdown last year in Victoria and there were many mistakes made and we learned a lot of things. Uh, the last two weeks, watching some of the stuff that's come out of New South Wales, it's felt like a bit of a flashback where I'm seeing some of the same things being repeated. You know, things like poor translation in communities where, you know, English speaking is low, the inconsistent rules, inconsistent messaging, unequal policing. Uh, has, do you guys feel like New South Wales has really learned from the mistakes Victoria made last year and incorporated that into their response? It's sort of the question everyone's been asking, really, particularly as we go back down a bit, because the, back down into lockdown because the infection spread here. Mary Louise McClaws will go straight to Sydney. Have you learnt from us? Good evening. First of all, I'd like to apologise <laughs> for getting our COVID, our COVID Delta strain. So, um, answering that very simply is uh, we haven't really learnt because we do everything on a state basis, not a national basis. So, for example. You learned from the second wave to go in early and go in hard, then get out early. Uh, you locked down on the third day when you had about 25 cases. We didn't lock down until we had 54 cases. Uh, you were in lockdown for 100 days until you got your last case, uh, and that was on day 28. We're at day 29, and we have 900, and I think it was 30 cases. Mm. So did we learn? No, sadly, we didn't learn from your experience. We didn't learn from the UK experience that have been giving us fantastic reports through the Public Health England reports telling us about their anxiety of Delta. We didn't learn from the anxiety of the UK and the USA. The USA has been telling us that their uh, sequence specimens have been doubling in um, proportion every two weeks for Delta now taking over. We certainly did learn from your North Melbourne experience where you went in very heavy handedly and didn't use your um, multicultural local community. We've gone in fairly heavy handed and I don't like seeing the police in Fairfield. Fairfield is about, um, on average, about 30% of the population where the average is about 23% that have, uh, you know, the high-density living, multi-generational uh, families, which is lovely, but the virus likes it. Uh, they can't work from home. Uh, about a third can't work from home, and the average level for Australia is about 20%. Mm. And so we've got a recipe for... Uh, an area where the virus will take off. Mary Louise, and we're going to get to some of those issues later on. We've got some questions exactly yep. about that and actually a guest joining us from um, uh, Western Sydney as well. So let's go around the panel in answer to that question about learning from the Victorian experience. Alison, what do you reckon? Absolutely not. I think uh, from an economic perspective, some of the key implement things that were implemented by the Victorian government to get out of our wave have not been observed, uh, have not been implemented at all. Um, we're talking the need to actually intervene into normal business operations and actually uh, instill something a bit stronger to actually you know, reduce output sometimes, reduce numbers of staff that are on site, uh, instill hospital grade PPE with, uh, in, in very high risk, high transmission environments. Um, what the Victorian government did to get out of, uh, to pull us through the last wave was to actually uh, you know, code every industry and workplace with a risk transmission um, setting. And so high risk environments were shut down. That's what it means to shut down non-essential businesses. And then environments that were high risk but essential, things like abattoirs, um, read, uh, like wholesaling, cleaning, the things that actually keep our, us all going in a time of lockdown, they had quite strict requirements to make sure all their staff were kept safe uh, and 
you know, coming out of the lockdown, there was also compliance measures. So when businesses had to be part of the compliance uh, schedule, it wasn't just put onto individuals. And we see with, with Gladys's, a lot of her, um, you know, her framing is this consistent f f falling back onto individual responsibility and common sense, but the government isn't actually doing the hard work of confronting their most vocal constituents, which are the business community, um, and doing the hard work of crawling into the business fabric and uh, instilling a more, you know, a, a, a healthier way that we can move through this trans, uh, to diminish transmission and to... But yeah, isn't this government. beyond Australia? Isn't this us just being narrow like we tend to be? I mean, you know, a year and a half ago, this virus was loose in China for four months while we were still talking about whether or not it was real. And we were saying to each other, w w what is lockdown? They they're locking down cities in China. They're locking down entire cities. And we were talking about whether or not it was a rumour. We were seeing videos on Facebook of, of people being arrested in the street and we, we were asking if they were real. Mm. Um, and we couldn't believe this thing was real and we were doing nothing about it here, nothing. Except we, had, we, but we had a very real experience here in, yes. in Victoria. And I just but what to... I'm saying is that this virus was... This strain was sure. loose in India... Four months ago. Let's just hear from Did everyone, though, in relation to this particular question about Victoria's lesson. And, you know, we went through it so hard well, that surely someone had to pick up the, the learnings, Wales as the phrase didn't goes. didn't learn anything from Victoria, Virginia, because New South Wales doesn't think it ever needs to learn anything from Victoria. New South Wales is a beast of its own. <laughs> I mean, they just looked at Victoria and thought, oh, poor old Victoria, they're in lockdown. Bad luck, we don't have to worry about them. And what's happened up there has been an absolute disgrace. I mean, you had the Chief Health, Chief Health Officer, Kerry Chan, asked, what is essential retail? And she said, oh, I can't define that. Uh, what is essential work? Oh, I can't define that. I mean, you have to define that. In Victoria, nothing was open except for a supermarket, a petrol station, a chemist and a bottle shop, of course. <laughs> nothing else. But in New South Wales, they've just let that rip. And our question is question about uh, the targeting of Fairfield. That has been an absolute disgrace. I mean, that, those suburbs that make up that LGA are full of hard-working Sydney-siders who have to go out all over Sydney every day of the week, tradies, plumbers, sparkies, whoever they are, and, and we're suddenly targeting them and saying, oh, you've done the wrong thing, you can't spread this around. They can't afford to stay at home. If they stay at home, they don't have an, a salary, can't put food on the table. Mukesh, okay, from a GP's can, can, point of view, what do you I think? Can I say that the lessons we learned in Victoria didn't come easy? Mm. We had a tough time beating seriously with my organisation, AMA Victoria, my uh, state president, Julian Wright, was in the face all the time saying, what are you doing about... Let's talk about PPE. We couldn't get PPE. Uh, we couldn't... You know, we had... We went through a really tough time dragging people into dealing with this from the health point of view, from making sure everybody was safe in health spaces. There was vi victim blaming, the, they're blaming my colleagues who were getting sick and unfortunately some dying for their, for, is their fault. Mm. It took a lot of effort. Um, my state vice president, my, uh, vice president, now president, was in that from the, from the hospital's point of view. It took a lot. We lost a health minister. We lost the secretary of the health department. We split the department into two. We've gone from a situation where we had no public health response to actually having to get it to a position where we can work. So, yes, we have learnt in Victoria, and people should be learning from us, um, but we have had to learn it the hard way ourselves. But now's the time to move ahead with those lessons that we have learnt. Um, yes, we've got to do social distancing. Yes, we've got to keep, keep masks on. And let's not be scared about it. Actually, I love my mask, believe it or not. And, and, <laughs> and, and you know, the, the, the next thing is, what do we do next to make this whole system work? No-one loves a mask. No. I feel naked without it. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 you feel weird? Yesterday, Prime Minister Morrison suggested that advice from Atagi had slowed the vaccine rollout, indicating that Atagi was now making decisions normally reserved for government ministers. Is the government actually running the vaccine rollout? Is the government taking responsibility for the vaccine rollout results? Or is it being left to the faceless men and women of the target? From beautiful Achuka, very noisy Achuka as well, <laughs> Mary Louise McClaws, we'll start with you. What did, what, what did the Prime Minister do in, and say in relation to Atagi? What did it mean to you? Well, Atagi gave the right decision that um, those under 60 need to understand that the data on um, adverse events hasn't changed. 
uh, then the federal government wants people to use the AstraZeneca because we don't have enough Pfizer. And so I think there's a bit of um, blaming, shifting of blame uh, towards ATAGI, where in fact ATAGI is basically saying the data hasn't changed and that really anybody who's already had a Pfizer, yes, go and get another one, but really we should be um, using Pfizer and the young ones. And I just remind you that the AstraZeneca uptake has slowed down for dose one for people 60 to 69. So they're the group that really, uh, for some reason, have got a bit confused about having AstraZeneca because the 70 and over have had dose one and two. So I, I think that all of this has caused a great deal of confusion in the community. There's been many changes of advice from uh, Atagi Mukesh. Yes. And, uh, and of course, the, the issue of uh, indemnifying yes. GPs like you in giving the AstraZeneca to a slightly younger cohort has been a live one. Uh, look, we um, have been advising on this since January. We knew the vaccines were going to come. We needed to be ready for this. We had a whole lot of things that we've talked to government to say, these are things you need to do. One of which was actually to say, uh, there should be some indemnity uh, in the situation, especially if there were going to be mishaps. But you've got it now, haven't you? Well, no. So it's been promised. It's been an announcement. Right. Uh, but nothing's come through. OK. And what uh, Marie Lewis is saying is absolutely right. The advice hasn't changed. Um, and uh, advice has changed, and we need to stick with the medical advice, and this is what it is. Yeah. Yes, there is opportunities for people who are not 60 to get the vaccine, mm. but you always had to get that conversation, and the Prime Minister was right, with your doctor, um, and then make sure that you do that. But we're getting people in their you know, 80s, 18s and 20s and 25 saying, I want a, uh, that vaccine. And that's not a reasonable thing to be doing. And so you, so you, you wouldn't vaccinate someone? No, I won't va in my practice, I won't vaccinate anybody under 60. Until with AstraZeneca? I see, with AstraZeneca, until I see that, uh, that uh, policy in place. I would then do it with that conversation not expect can, I, can I just jump in there? So the indemnification is one thing which sort of yeah. protects you legally then should there be uh, a suit that arises from an adverse effect. But what about the cons medical concern itself about uh, vaccinating someone that young with AstraZeneca? Do you have that concern? Yes, I would. So I'd be, I'd be really concerned about somebody who's even under 40. Um, and again, a whole I'm... lot of people I know in their 20s, when the Prime Minister said that the other week, said, yes. you know, go and talk to your GP. A whole bunch of people I know went and got AstraZeneca straight away. Yep. They're fine, they're good, which is great to hear, and they had no hesitation doing it. Well, we had a lot of people at the very beginning. We started vaccinating 22nd of, right. of March, and most, well, none of the people touch wood we've had have had any problems. And we know it's a very small number of people that are going to get problems. And the other thing we have learned is that we know what to watch out for. And if you know what to watch out for, you get in early, you can do something about it. But the, the, we, we actually need to um, use the, the Pfizer for the people under, under 60 at the moment. If we do go down to 55 or 50, as we were doing with the previous mm. lockdown, uh, there needs to be that conversation. There is a risk. It's not a big risk, but there is a risk. Uh, and people uh, who may have a misadventure should be looked after by government if there's an issue. It's their programme. They've bought it. They've sponsored it. They've said they're going to pay for it with a no-fault conversation. Well, let's see please if indemnification comes through. Please give us but that. Wasn't Michelle, it, can I just ask... Uh, sorry, sorry, just jump in there. Um, Michelle, did you get vaccinated? I've had my first Pfizer shot, but it was really hard to find. I, I did everything they told me to do. I went on the website, I went to my GP, he didn't have it, he didn't, didn't know what to do. He said, go to the website. I went to the website, I got an appointment that was ages away. But I found out, I had my ear to the ground, and I found out that I could get a shot at the commission flats near my house. So I went down there. Are you in there. Williamstown? Hey? Williams yes. How did you know? <laughs> yes. My You're local there. area. I know about it. I didn't recognise you with your mask. So hang on, were, were, so you, were you allowed to do yeah. that? Yeah. So I went down there with my um, uh, Medicare card and I got my shot and a free coffee. Were you, were you taking a Pfizer <laughs> yeah. vaccine, though, from someone from the Commission no, no, was no. supposed to get it? No, 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 no. OK. Are you joking? Just checking. Uh, no, um, they're pretty rough flats. Um, <laughs> they're no, th they I... were throwing eggs down from there. And, and not they're... me, they're not. No, but they were they're throwing <laughs> eggs at people down from no, there. <laughs> no, not me, they're not. I've got his friends there. So how did you manage to work the system? Uh, I don't know. I think that's the way the system works. They you... didn't have enough arms to put vaccines in. and they don't... If you don't use it within six hours, you of lose course. the vaccine. Yeah. Right. So it's yeah, better in, a, in an arm. There are places they don't advertise it, Steve. No, Steve but I can, I can take you if you want to go. I'll protect you. <laughs> no, I'm right. I've had my two AstraZeneca. Oh, okay. I'm fine. Oh. But I know people in Sydney. I know a guy who's a fireman and his wife who's a, uh, a sports uh, physio. And they can't get Pfizer. They've tried to book and it's a week, two weeks, three weeks down the track. 
and they're frontline people dealing with people and they mm. can't get Pfizer. I mean, but AstraZeneca, didn't that save the UK? I Absolutely. Mean, it's... It did. So, 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 I, I, so I why, like... why are you so against...? No, no, I'm not against it. Um, but, you know, I, for, for me, the worry was... In, in the UK, the, the, their cut-off was 30 and they did very well. But then when they dropped the rate of infection, because they did so well with the vaccination, the, the community rates increased. So they actually increased it. Um, Mary Louise, you can sort of come in on this if you like. You know, the, they went up to 40 because it, the, of, that, of that ambient spread. And I think that's the problem we, we keep, have the to The recover. non-medical people here, though, are going, well, if it saved the UK, why can't it save us? If we got so much of it, well, we make a million Ma doses let's a hear week. From Mary Louise. Well, I was just going to say, Steve, that one of the issues is that Delta now has taken over. And AstraZeneca is fine for saving people from death and hospitalisation. But the group that you want to save from transmitting it, acquiring it and transmitting it, are the younger ones, the 20 to 39-year-olds. And they need Pfizer because it's got a better response to Delta. Mm. And you can give them the second shot faster. Now, sure, AstraZeneca's great. I've had my AstraZeneca's and I'm probably not going to die or get severe illness. But because of my age, I don't see as many people as young people do. They've got a very large social network. And that's where you want to cut the cycle of acquisition and transmission. And that's why I'm more supportive of Pfizer for the young ones. Oh, well, Alison, you're sitting here and you can't get anything, right? Well, no. And also, young people are... They form the largest portion of the, the workforce that moves around a lot, right? Yeah. And we pay also taxes and keeps the healthcare system going. We'll get to you eventually. <laughs> stop, stop fussing. <laughs> Better move the flag, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I watched the Q&A program last week or the week before and there was a really great question from uh, a bloke called Tristan. And he asked... And I think he represented a lot of young people as well as I did, which was just... What can I do to make this better? I'll take a risk if it's going to ensure that we, as a, as a policy, can collectively move out of these lockdowns and these problems, we can move onto the horizon. And the, the response from the, the experts on the panel was that on a health front, there are more risks to you of taking AstraZeneca and it's better that you vote, you wait for, for Pfizer. And then on a policy front, you going out and taking that vaccine isn't going to change the timelines. Would you take AstraZeneca? I, as soon as... Morrison did that presser. I was one of those people on every yep. place I could go looking for it. And then I watched the program and I also... Um, I've followed Atagi's advice. I'm also the daughter of a registered nurse and <laughs> I, I respect the public healthcare system and in a time of, you know, Trumpian attacks on all of our, you know, important institutions, I, I'm just going to follow that advice. And there's also research, I don't know, that's come out today that shows that is, um, you know, reinforced by... Uh, uh, research that shows that young people are more at risk of blood clots than they would. And but if, if I have COVID on my... Advice, if, yeah. if I was in Sydney, I would be getting AstraZeneca. Steve, well. just before we move on, I just wanted to ask you... Your, uh, I'll, I'll come back to you, Mary Louise. But I just wanted to ask you, uh, what was your read on Kevin Rudd's intervention into trying to get us some Pfizer earlier? <laughs> oh, he's just had a bit of uh, tension deficit syndrome, Kevin. He likes to... <laughs> Stick his hand. I don't know how that letter would have ever got into the hands of the ABC. I have no imagine. idea. Couldn't imagine. <laughs> Absolutely um, no idea. We had Malcolm Turnbull on the, the project to talk about that, and Malcolm and Kevin are now best buddies. I uh, <laughs> don't remember them being so friendly <laughs> when uh, Kevin was trying to become the UN Secretary General. Attention deprivation does that to yeah, former Prime does. Ministers, I suspect. Um, Mary Louise, do you want to just jump in there? Yes, I was just going to say that there's um, evidence that AstraZeneca works very well, or Pfizer. How, and, and that was from the UK when they were looking at uh, the impact from vaccinating young people uh, from December to the end of March. Problem is that that was with Alpha, and now there's Delta. Delta's twice as infectious. And we do know from Qatar and from uh, other areas that uh, AstraZeneca seems to have at least a... Oh, 20 percentage point lower vaccine, uh, vaccine efficacy, uh, even with that second dose for symptomatic infection. And in people like Alison and, um, and, and Michelle, uh, they yep. are young enough yep. to be able to transmit it. And we want them to have a great um, immune response uh, so that they don't get symptomatic infection yep. and therefore their uh, viral load is lower and that they're less likely to keep spreading it in the community.
Do you think it's possible Michelle is that... taking the age discount, I've noticed. I've got to move on, Michelle, so just quickly. Ask if, if, if it's possible that we in Australia have become blasé about actually getting COVID. Like, we're so worried about AstraZeneca. Like, I just don't want COVID. Yeah, I correct. think I would take... Honestly, well, hence, yeah, hence the change in the Atagi advice, which is if you have COVID, even this variant at large, go and get whatever vaccine yeah. is available to I don't you. Want so anyone I love to get COVID. Yeah. You know? uh, very, very quickly, Mary Louise. Yeah, it, that'll be fine if our government offers a booster of um, messenger RNA vaccine for your third one, and then that will increase yeah. your immune response. In an attempt to promote vaccination and stay-at-home orders, the federal government recently released a shocking new ad campaign depicting a young woman gasping for air whilst attached to a ventilator. However, the vast majority of those under 40 are ineligible for a vaccine due to an apparent lack of supply. Young Australians like myself are now seeing our fully vaccinated friends overseas getting back to normal while we are still living in and out of lockdowns. Why did the Morrison government spend taxpayer dollars to produce an advertisement featuring the wrong demographic and not one promoting the benefits of vaccination instead? Well, we've got two young women on the panel here, I guess, who are... Yeah, you'll yeah. take that age discount yeah. too. Yeah. Who I guess this, uh, this ad was aimed at. Alison, did it work for you? It is, like, if there was... It was possible for Morrison to gaslight anymore. <laughs> was, like, that is, like, the upper limit of it. Like, it's, like... <laughs> it's, um... I mean, even talking of, like, the fatigue of lockdowns, I can't entertain <sighs> that when, like, everyone's made huge sacrifices, but until I have something in my arm and an opportunity to access that vaccine, um, I won't... I can't entertain that lockdowns are going to, you know, these have to end, because we can... We do it and we save lives doing it. Um, I... First seeing that ad, uh, distressed, and I thought, why is the federal government... <laughs> there we go. Why is the federal government... Uh, why is it trying to instill deep fear in people? It has not given us a public health campaign since the pandemic hit, 18 months in. Uh, I grew up in a time of slip, slop, slap and, you know, big public health campaigns that you can do them when you actually want to achieve, you know, public health outcomes. What this ad for me is doing is achieving, distilling fear. It's, it's deepening fear and I think this is very typical of the way the federal government's politics are shaped. It's not concerned about... Uh, bringing people together, of which all of the research shows that um, messages of solidarity and take, make this sacrifice because it's for the good of everyone. If you look at everyone else's ads internationally, smiling faces, people coming together, the sacrifices we made, we're all better off together, and we've got that. And it features a young woman, a young person, who can't even access the bloody vaccine. I mean, it's... It's a bad ad, but, I, I mean, I think it's unfair to say that uh, Scott Morrison is trying to deliberately somehow gaslight people. I mean, he uh, hasn't had a great record in his career of producing great ads. We all remember Lara Bingle, and that didn't work that well either. But <laughs> the federal government w would genuinely be trying to come up with some way to get more people to get vaccinated. Oh, you just that don't get us millennials, ad. Steve. You don't get us. <laughs> OK, Michelle, no, actually, honestly, explain the millennial point yeah, of view on this, then. <laughs> no, but honestly, I, I, will, I will confess to my age, because I am struggling to care about this issue, Steve, I have to admit, because I just think this whole story about how old the lady in the ad is is such a kind of... Um, Typical, and I, I'm, go, I'm going outside... Say it. You've had I'm your going outside, no, <laughs> You've but, had your job. I'm going outside of Australia again, and I'm saying, look, it's just a very... Um, privileged kind of argument to be having. I think, you know, fly two hours north of Darwin and, and land in Indonesia, and do you think anyone cares about how old the lady in the ad is? Like, we're so lucky in this country, and if that is honestly the most important thing that we can talk about, and I was like, the most important thing, I, I, and I, I'm sorry, and I know you, it's, it's gaslighting and all of that, but, um, but I think... Gosh, we are really lucky in Australia. Can I... I'll try another but, but, angle but for you. But can I just finish what I... I just yeah. want to... On, my, my reaction to that is that, you know, in Indonesia they're running out of oxygen and the money that was spent on that ad would have bought a lot of oxygen for Indonesia. So you're saying the advertising campaigns, it doesn't matter what I they come up with. I couldn't care less. Can I, I, can care I try less another angle? Lady yeah, no, go on. Because I want to hear, from, hear from Steve again. I think it was cut off, so... Um, which rarely happens. But I, Alison, I'm, go I mean, I take, I'm like, being he's very blank. polite. <laughs> he's blank. I'm being very polite. Yeah. I think it's, like, deeply offensive to say that people concerned about um, a virus that's killing millions of people... And no, don't have, an ad. 
Yeah, but the fact they got the, the point of the context of the ad is that we don't have any vaccines. That's the context of the ad, and that matters. And so, I will take away the word gaslighting because it's something that you didn't. No, like. uh, no. It's, but how about I, I use the word lowering expectations? Because if if we look at that and we say this is okay, everything that's going on right now in this mm -hmm. deep crisis-ridden country of this deep political crisis and this health crisis, and this is okay. For me, that's not OK. And I think that's part of being in a democracy, part of lifting expectations and about looking out across Australia and saying, like, we can do better than this. It doesn't make us privileged. You know, we can sit back and be like, it's great that we're not... Like, we are saving people's lives right now. But the reason why we're doing that is because Australians believe in the public health care system and they believe that we can make sacrifices to save each other's we're lives. We're lucky to have a public health care system. I want, to, I want to come to Mary Louise McCaws. Mary Louise, I'll come to you, but can I just quickly say, for the record, I think it's important because, you know, everyone's having a red-hot go at the advertising campaign here. We did work very hard to try and get a member of the federal government on the panel this evening, including, we asked Greg Hunt, Barnaby Joyce, Jane Hume, Bridget McKenzie, David Gillespie, number available to us. I understand we will have one next week, which is terrific, but just so that position is represented. They're not excluded, they just weren't able to come. Mary Louise? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's my understanding that this ad was made last year and only released now. And I think that it's the wrong time to be released. It uh, reminds me of the first pandemic I ever worked in, with, it, which was HIV, and with the bowling ball ad yep. that made people think that HIV was, you know, would hit you randomly. And then there was a brilliant ad by... Um, Glenn Mabbott and Edward Richards, and it said, if it's not on, it's not on. And the reason that was such a great ad is it, it engendered um, a, an empowerment uh, of people that got it, that you didn't have to worry about your um, sexuality. All you had to remember was, if you're going to have sex and that's casual, if it's not on, it's not on. And it was really fantastic. And we need an ad for particularly the young ones that I'm so concerned about, the 20 to 39 year olds, that gives them power about, you yeah. know, the fact we love them and we care for them. Uh, well, the problem with the, the ad uh, just going saying. back was that we didn't have enough vaccine, so they didn't want to have this fantastic ad to get everyone to rush out and get an injection because we didn't have anything to put in their arms. Hi, I'd like to present you with a fantasy scenario. If you were handed the top leadership position to get us through and out of this um, pandemic devoid of politics, media bias and avoidable factors that have seen Australia in the situation that we're in right now, how you, would you do it? All right, so one great idea each from our panellists to get us out of this mess. I'd Mary make, Louise? Uh, Mary oh, you'd Louise, like to start... I would make Mary Louise McClaws <laughs> Prime Minister. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Today. Well, that sorts the problem. Right now. Mary Louise, would you accept the position? What would be your big idea? Oh, first of all, I'd redo the vaccine rollout to focus on the dose one for the 60 to 69-year-olds they really are not taking up their vaccine. Secondly, I'd be focusing on the 20 to 39-year-olds. So those two groups are the two groups that I'd be concerned about. And can I have one more? Quickly. I get on the phone to Bibi Netanyahu and uh, Biden and ask them to help me get more Pfizer. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Alison? Uh, I think the pandemic has shone a light on the scourge of insecure work in Australia and they've insecure workers not knowing when they're going to have their pay week to week, are having to turn out, rain or shine, sickness or not, and um, put money on, bills on, uh, food on the table. I would say uh, strengthen our industrial relations laws to allow casual workers to have more permanency, have sick leave so they can stay home. It's going to help us get through the pandemic and um, allow them to come together in the workplace and advocate for better, better wages and conditions so they can power themselves to push COVID out of the workplace as well as have income security to, to get through. Steve Price? I've given you my suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's She's it. Prime Minister. She's in charge. <laughs> All right. I would take the parochialism out of it. I, mean, I know that's a big ask, but uh, even today we had uh, uh, my friend Daniel Andrews pushing back <laughs> over browsing in New South Wales, having a shot at what uh, Gladys Berejiklian had said. I just wish that these state premiers and the state and the federal government could all work together. I mean, we haven't heard this phrase for a while, we're all in this together. Guys, we are in all, all in this together. For God's sake, just fix it. Michelle? I would refund social services and uh, the public service in Australia so we might have a shot at actually rolling something out. All right. <laughs> and Mukesh? Yeah, I'd like to see a lot of the promises that have been made come true. 
If we get no-fault compensation, people don't get so scared of getting a vaccine. We can get some of the uh, other age groups to get their, their, their uh, AstraZeneca that we do have. We need to get more Pfizer into the country, and we need to have that parochialism out of this. I think a C, a, a, in a CDC kind of outfit that does all of these sort of nationally, uh, the, these out, out, you know, out, outrolling of what we need to do and do it well, uh, so we can just get on as a country, mm -hmm. not as little villages. And that's all we have time for this evening. Would you please thank our marvellous panel, Mukesh Hakawal, Michelle Laurie, Steve Price, Alison Pennington, and in Sydney, Mary Louise McClaws. Thank you.